And we are entering into a new section. Uh, if you want to turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, a new section of the Sermon on the Mount. And really, what we've covered, you know, verses 21 to 48, were really one big other section where Jesus is applying the law of God to the human conscience. He is taking the law and he's applying it to the believer and he's, he's teaching on that law and really sort of the, the practical application. But now we start to get into behaviors. We start to get into uh, what many scholars are calling practical righteousness. Again, the last half of Matthew 5 is about the law, but chapter 6 begins to expand further examples of application. So not just the law itself applied to the Christian mind and heart, but now the actual behaviors and the ethical uh, steps to follow. And so chapter 6 really takes a different shape than chapter 5. If you're reading the Sermon on the Mount, there's a decided and a very noticeable change in the course of the narrative. While you might call chapter 5 the precepts of the kingdom of God, really is chapters 6 and 7 are the practices of the kingdom. When This is what godly obedience looks like when it's lived out. That's the whole point. One thing we need to make note of here is that Jesus focuses on the religion of the heart over and against the Pharisees' religion of appearances. They did everything for show, but Jesus doesn't care about the show. He wants to go for what's inside. God cares less about ritualistic obedience than he does for genuine, heartfelt devotion. And in this way, Jesus will get very personal in the next section of his sermon. He does not speak in generalities, but in specifics. And if you thought that it got personal when we talked about uh, marriage and divorce and sexual morality and all those things, if if that got personal for you, this is going to be even more personal. In verses 1 through 18 of chapter 6, Jesus addresses three key areas. Now, in the context, these were three areas of Jewish piety, three really hallmarks of who they were as religious people. But these are applicable for us, certainly. Three areas of piety, namely prayer, fasting, and giving. So now Jesus is going to get into your spiritual disciplines and your your body, your eating, and your your physical condition. He's going to get into your prayer closet, and he's going to get into your wallet. He gets very personal in this section of the scriptures. He teaches on prayer in verses 5 through 13. He teaches on fasting in verses 16 and 17. And then he buttons up uh, two places about giving, verses 1 through 4, which is what we're going to hit today. And then uh, toward the end of the section, verses 19 to 24, he talks about money. And again, for the purposes of today, we're going to look at just the first four verses of chapter 6. And so if you're in chapter 6, let's look at this together. Now, it's helpful to see that chapter 6, there's a progression to the chapter. Uh, Jesus uh, is a logical thinker. He builds his arguments and moves along in his sermon. And this, again, this topic area is sensitive. It is personal. It's dealing with money. It's dealing with possessions, devotional life, food, hunger, even anxiety. In chapter, the end of chapter 6, we're going to spend a couple weeks talking about stress and anxiety. If you don't think that's applicable to today... It's almost like God knew that we were going to hit Matthew chapter 6 during election season. But we're talking about stress and anxiety, so God God is is kind to us because we're going to be covering this issue, which is really important. I think it's one of the biggest issues plaguing people today is how they deal with fear, stress, and anxiety. But again, verses 1 through 18, this is sort of a unit, and verse 1 really begins as a theme verse, a theme verse. Uh, Let's look at this together. Matthew 6, 1. Matthew 6, 1. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Again, this is really the theme verse. This is the summary verse of the next three examples. When he talks about, uh, about giving, he talks about prayer, he talks about fasting. This is the overarching theme verse of all of this teaching. Jesus cautions the listener to beware, beware. Prosecco in the Greek, it means to take care, to be on guard, to watch out for. Depending on what translation of the Bible you use, some might say uh, take care, watch out, be on guard. He wants them to be paying attention to these actions, to what's coming next. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men. What does he mean by practicing your righteousness? Well, when we read the Apostle Paul, 
we note that almost uniformly, Paul is dealing with righteousness in the context of being an alien righteousness, a righteousness that does not belong to us. We know that because of the fall and because of human depravity, that there's nothing inherently righteous inside of us. I can't go to God and claim that I'm some kind of virtuous or righteous person in and of myself. Any righteousness that we have as believers comes to us through Christ, by Christ. He gives us of his righteousness in order to justify us. That's what we, we've talked about that before. And so this righteousness of Christ is credited to us by faith. This is called imputed Righteousness. Again, we don't possess anything inherent uh, that is uh, germane in us that is inherently good. Any righteousness I have is given to me by Christ. But that is not what Jesus has in mind here. He's not talking about practicing your imputed righteousness. Uh, that's not what he's referring to. Rather, this, uh, this practice, first century Jews would have practiced a, a, a practical righteousness having to do with their personal piety how they live their lives as religious people. These are matters of personal religious obedience, ways to demonstrate your religious devotion. We have these things today. They have these things back then. Now, inherently, this is not a bad thing. It's not bad. After all, Jesus says in Matthew 5.16, he tells the people, let your light shine before men in such a way that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So we're talking about doing good deeds for the cause of God. That's a good thing. You want people to see that you're living a life of godliness before the world in order to bear witness to Christ. That's important. And again, all that goes to the glory of God. Your righteousness that is practiced before other people, the whole point of that is to point other people, not to yourself, but to God, so he gets glory. But here, Jesus warns of practicing the good deeds of righteousness for the purpose for the purpose of being noticed by other people. Huge difference here. He uses this word uh, theomai, which is where we get the word theater, where we derive that word. It pertains to doing something as a spectacle for others to gaze at, to go and put yourself on display and perform something so that other people can look. That's what he's talking about. When you put on a show so that other people will see you. In fact, Jesus blasts the Pharisees for this very same thing. In Matthew 23, verses 5 through 7, charges that the Pharisees, he says, they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries, and they lengthen their tassels, and they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues, and respectful greetings in the marketplaces, and being called rabbi. They just bask in all this self-glory because they, they put on a big show. They want everybody in town to see them walk by on the street and say, Wow, that's a righteous person. How do you know? Well, because they look so righteous. They love that. They just ate it up when people would praise them for how righteous they were. They loved putting on a show and they loved receiving praise from other people. But Jesus warns, he warns here, if you practice your righteousness in order to be noticed, if you're doing what you're doing as a believer for the purpose of being noticed by other people, he says, then you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. That's a very serious thing to say. God sees, and Jesus says, he will not reward you. Now, this warning against the theatrical displays of the religious righteousness, this pertains to three acts of piety, okay? So again, verse 1 is the overarching verse, the theme verse. Beware of practicing your righteousness. Now, what are the examples of righteousness? And Jesus gives three, the three big ones in Jewish culture, again, prayer, fasting, and giving. They did these things outwardly to be seen by men. Now, we are going to talk about prayer, We are going to talk about fasting and self-sacrifice in the coming weeks, but today I want to address the area of giving. Now, the Bible does have much to say about financial giving. In the Old Testament law, every Jewish family was required to give a tenth of all of their income for the maintenance of the Levitical priesthood. And for the ministry, this is from Leviticus 27.30, from Numbers 18.21, Of course, it was not said you're giving to the Levitical priesthood per se. Rather, Leviticus 27.30 says that you're actually giving to the Lord. 
When you give to the Lord's ministry, you're giving to the Lord himself. That's the connection that is made in the text. After all, everything that you have already belongs to the Lord, and so giving to his ministry is simply returning a portion to him of what he's given to you. Because we can't, when you're born, they don't, when you leave the hospital, they don't give you any money. They don't give you any, they might give you some swaddling cloth. They might give you a couple diapers, but they don't give you anything that you're going to take with you that you have inherently. You certainly don't come out of the womb with anything that you possess. You have nothing. You are naked. You have nothing. All you have is your parents' medical bills. That's it. You have nothing. So we, and I'm, I'm emphasizing that point because we have a tendency to believe that the things that we have are things that we possess. My house, my car, my property, my money, my wallet, my job, my this, my books. Well, the books are kind of... <laughs> Nothing is yours. Nothing is yours. Everything you have has been given to you. Everything. Your family, your spouse, your children, your relationships... Everything is a gift of God. Now, going back, regarding the Old Testament, again, 10% went to the Levitical priesthood, but there's, there's more than 10%, actually. If you, if you study it out and look at the numbers, there was a second tithe that was given for the Lord's Feast in Jerusalem, and then every third year, okay, they would take that tithe every third year, that tithe was used for benevolence for the poor, so scholars estimate, and I've read this in many places, scholars estimate that if you look at all the number of, of tithes and offerings and everything that existed in Israel, uh, the giving was somewhere between 22 and 25% annually. Keeping in mind, however, that Israel was a theocracy, for lack of a better word, so the religious and the civil government were commingled. So when you gave to the ministry, you were giving to uh, the temple, you're giving to the worship, you're giving to the, uh, to the maintenance of government, you're giving to the court, you're giving to everything. So functioning society was paid for by the people of God, and they gave of their money. And so Old Testament giving equated both to paying your taxes and giving to, finan- uh, giving to gospel or the Lord's ministry. Now, by the time you get to the New Testament, there is no such command to tithe. We've covered this before, uh, but I'll cover it again. Uh, is it because God no longer employs the use of money in the ministry? Of course not. Of course he does. Money is still needed. But the, the principle is applied differently. It is no longer a hard and fast Number. It's not 10%, it's not 20%, it's not 25%. And I've heard all kinds of sermons to the contrary, New Testament sermons to the contrary, that misunderstand and misrepresent the plain teaching of Scripture. There is no number that is to be fastened to you when it comes to your financial giving. Instead, the Lord grants liberality. He grants you liberty to determine what you are to give. Now, again, this is not exhaustive, but I do want to bring to mind several general principles with regards to New Testament giving. So these are general principles, not exhaustive. I want to just give you just a very brief overview. Just a few things. Number one, number one, giving is a spiritual discipline. Giving is a spiritual discipline. In the New Testament, there are a plethora of verses that that deal with financial giving within the realm of the spiritual So it's not simply a nuts and bolts, pen and paper kind of a thing. Everything is connected to spirituality when it comes to giving in the New Testament. Just a couple of examples in Luke 16.10 connects giving to faithfulness, giving to faithfulness in verse time. Uh, Verse 9, he talks about using your money to make spiritual gains. And then Jesus says, he who is faithful in very little will be faithful also in much. And so giving here by Jesus is tied to faithfulness. 2 Corinthians 9.13 I believe we heard that this morning. Paul says that giving to gospel ministry is an obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ. Giving to gospel ministry is part of your obedience to the confession that you bear. You say you're a Christian. There are certain obediences that pour out of that confession. Again, if you believe in the ministry of the gospel, you ought to be faithful in giving to the ministry of the gospel. Your your talk and your walk have to match up. So giving is a spiritual discipline. Number two, number two, giving is personally determined. Personally determined. Nobody, not even the pastor, nobody can tell you what to give. It is between you and God. You and God. 
No one at this church, certainly no one in the elder board, is going to come to you, sit down with your checkbook, and walk through line by line and say, okay, now I've noticed that you're da 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 and going down the line. I've had those kinds of evaluations done. We actually came and planted the church in order to, to qualify for a certain financing and certain benefits. I had to turn over absolutely everything. I've had the church and I've had the nomination walk through every single thing in my life, my income, my debt, my credit cards, my student loans, everything. My, what I spend my money on, I had to take a, a course on finances, the whole gamut. So I've had people in my pocketbook before. I've had people going through my checkbook, and I know how that feels. And I think it was appropriate. It was very appropriate, and we submitted ourselves to it because we knew that it was the right thing. But when it comes to free will giving, nobody is going to sit down with you and walk you through that unless you ask them to. Your giving is between you and God. 2 Corinthians 9.7 this is, this is the word of the Lord. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. You're not going to do this because you feel pressed to do it by anybody else. And for heaven's sakes, do not walk up to the offering box and sort of hold your money in your hand and could have used this for something else and then put it in begrudgingly. If that's the case, then fish it out and take it home with you. God says this is not to be done grudgingly, under compulsion. And then the Bible says this, for God loves a cheerful giver. He wants you to be joyful when you give of what you have to the ministry of the gospel and to others. This other week we talked about making vows to the Lord. We we covered that. Isn't that appropriate? It's like, my goodness, the Lord just lined it all up. Your yes is yes, your no is no. So whatever you say you're going to do, in terms of wanting to go here, do this, give that, whatever your decisions are, don't make promises, don't make pledges that you can't keep. Rather, let your yes be yes, your no be no. The whole idea Jesus was teaching us is have integrity before God. Have integrity. Just a quick story. I remember this from several years ago. I was uh, on a leadership board at a different church, and we were having a discussion about the order of service, and they were trying to find ways to tighten it up because it was very, very long uh, and it was just sort of uh, loaded up with extra things. And they were talking about, uh, well, should we, should we continue to pass the plate or should we just stick a box in the back of the room? And I specifically remember one of the, the men in the room said, if we don't pass the plate, giving is going to go down by 15%. I went, oh, okay. And I, we started to think about that. And I, I said, really, is that true? And, oh, yeah, it's going to go down if we do that. Interesting. My question, I guess, is, If that's the case, then does the church really want that 15%? Because are you putting the extra in because someone else in the aisle is watching you? I don't know if you've ever been in churches before where the plate goes by. And I'm not not disparaging churches who do that. I think it's a practical way to do it. I think nine times out of ten, the person simply forgets in the moment. Oh, gee whiz, I forgot. Honey, where's the check? And you put it in and you let let it pass. But there's always that, that feeling in the moment where you go, oh, no, the plate's coming. And you reach in your pocket and say, what do I have? I totally forgot. And you're, you're kind of looking around and you quickly just put it in. You pass it. You know, all the games that we play as human beings to try to deal with this sense of guilt or shame that we have. But do we really want that extra guilt offering? The 15% you're going to get by pressure? Now, again, I don't want to disparage practices. There's a reason we have the offering box in the back of the room. That's a, that's a, phil- a philosophical decision. But the point is not how you take the offering. The point is what's going on inside the heart of the giver while they're giving their offering. Again, giving is supposed to be done before God and only God. Truthfully, only God cares about what you give. I'm not personally attached to your giving. People, you know, it's always interesting as a pastor where where folks will, they'll come to me and they'll they'll talk to me about their giving and I don't see your giving. That's a practice that we've done since the beginning. We look at the bottom line. I see the bottom line. I have no idea what any of you give. I have no idea even if you give. It doesn't make a difference to me. The Lord will provide for his church in the way he sees fit. It has nothing to do with you and me or the elders and you or nothing like that. This is something you do as a spiritual discipline before God and God alone. He is the one who works with you to determine that. Number three, number three, giving is to be done generously. 
giving is to be done generously. Paul cites the example of the Macedonian churches in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, who although they were impoverished, they were impoverished, they gave liberally. Paul says beyond their ability, even begging them to be able to give more. These impoverished people went back to the apostles and says, we want to give more than we're able. And they said, well, you probably shouldn't do that. No, we don't care. We want to give. So Paul uses them as an example of financial giving and of giving generously. I'm reminded, and we're going to probably talk about this uh, a little bit later on today, but I'm reminded of Exodus 35 and 36. I don't know if you're familiar with this passage of Scripture. It's when Israel was called by God to, to build the tabernacle, to eventually build the temple. And the text tells us that the people of God were bringing their free will offerings every single morning, and they brought so much, in fact, that Moses had to issue a proclamation to all the people to tell them to stop giving. Can you imagine me coming to the pulpit and saying, all right, we're full, folks. Please, don't give anything else. I don't think you're going to hear a sermon from me on that. But that's what Moses does. He says, look, you're giving too much. We have too much for the temple. And he, he asks the Lord, he makes a command, a proclamation, you need to stop because they've already received so much. But that's the heart of it. That's the heart of giving, that the heart over, over is overjoyed to give beyond measure. So giving is to be done generously. Number four, giving is an exercise of love. Giving is an exercise of love. Love for God, first and foremostly, but also love for others. Again, in 2 Corinthians 8.8, 8, Paul notes that generous giving proves, he says, the sincerity of your love. Because we love God, we give to his ministry. Because we love others, we give to meet their needs. We read about this in Titus, the book of Titus, all the way through, engaging in good deeds to meet these kinds of needs. One last principle to cover this morning, and again, there are many principles you could find uh, in the Bible about giving, but one last that I want to hit, and again, it's not exhaustive, but number five, number five, giving produces spiritual blessing. Giving produces spiritual blessing. Uh, Luke 6.38, Jesus says, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, they will pour into your lap. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Now that verse has been misapplied grotesquely by prosperity gospel preachers as a method of becoming wealthy. If you, and I've talked about this a couple weeks ago. You know, if you, they would say that if you want to go and become a millionaire, then you have to give a certain number and you can mathematically you know, sort of guilt God into uh, giving you more money and so on and so forth. But that's not the Lord's meaning. He's not giving you a prescription for how you are to become wealthy. That's not the point. The principle is that if you're stingy to give, then you will not receive back very much. But if you give generously, the Lord will bless you richly. Again, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, for God is able to bless you abundantly. Now, if the blessing you receive is determined by God, you don't know what that blessing is going to be. No one knows what that's going to be. I can't tell you. I can't promise you. If you give X and you're going to get Y, Z, I can't do that. Only God knows. God may bless you with material wealth. People who are financially generous also oftentimes reap financially as well, but not all the time. That doesn't happen all the time. God also may bless you with abundant friendships. Maybe you're not returned financially, but maybe in your giving, other people just flock to you and your relationships and your your love and your connections with other people intensify, become stronger through your giving and your generosity. But God also may bless you with great joy because you may give generously and not receive anything in return. You may give generously and no one ever finds out or knows and gets drawn to you. you You might be living your life alone on some regard. But God may also bless you with great joy. Great joy. According to Acts 20, 35, Jesus said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. You will will receive more joy from God in your generosity than you will in receiving a gift. In fact, I I tend to think and tend to find that when you're on the, the receiving end of the gift, it's very humbling. Someone gives you a very generous gift, your first instinct isn't to go, wow, look at all this money. That's never our instinct, is it? When they give you something that's generous, your first instinct is to 
to be taken aback. and Oh, my word. Thank you so much. I, I don't deserve this, right? That's, you don't receive the immediate joy. It's, it throws you back a little bit. Now, you might rejoice in the Lord later on. You should. But on the other side of that, when you get to be the person to be generous, and you leave and you do it the right way, you become very joyful. Oh, I praise God that I got to, to give and bless this family. Praise the Lord. You know, it produces great joy. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Again, these are just general principles. Now, Jesus is going to have more to say on the topic of money in chapter 6, verses 19 to 24. But I want to go back to our text here today because Jesus seizes on the principle of charitable giving and he addresses the matter of the heart. We've talked about all the other peripheral things uh, already, but I want to get back to Matthew 6 here and looking at the issue of the heart. Jesus says, verse 2, So when you give to the poor... Do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, if you give. Rather, he says, when you give to the poor. Again, this is an Old Testament command, Deuteronomy 14, Exodus 23, uh, Leviticus 23. This is also an expectation in the New Testament. If you read the epistle written by James, chapters 1 and 2 talk specifically about uh, caring for widows and orphans and taking care of the poor. And so there's a, there's a mandate on the Christian church uh, to, to deal with matters of benevolence. Uh, our church has benevolence. Uh, many of you, I know, have given to other, other folks. Um, there's a, even a, a, a campaign on, online right now. There's a family that we're praying for, and they're fundraising money. And praise God, in the first day, we've already raised $10,000 for this family and it, who's at Dartmouth right now. We'll talk about them during prayer. Um, but the Lord loves to, to bless people and take care of people through the, the generosity of the church. Paul exhorts believers on Crete. Uh, Titus 3.14, to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs. You see a need that's pressing, you've you got to do everything you can to meet it. Again, if you can. If you can't, well, that's up to the Lord. But if you can meet the need, the Bible says try to meet that need. That's part of who we are as believers. Because God has extended mercy to us, we are to extend mercy to other people. But Jesus says here, when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. Now this is very interesting. There's been a lot of discussion on whether or not the Pharisees and Sadducees actually blew a trumpet prior to making their offering. I've read song commentators that say, oh yeah, it was their practice to go and and make all this noise and clanging cymbals and do all this stuff to draw attention to themselves. But other scholars don't think that's necessarily the case. There's no evidence of that. However, it's interesting that the giving receptacles in the temple courts were shofars. They were literally ram's horns that were used as trumpets. And so scattered out all throughout the court were these huge horns, these huge trumpets, and you'd throw your money into these, for lack of a better word, trumpet, and that's where they would collect it. So it was a literal trumpet. So there could be some wordplay here by Jesus when he's talking about the giving receptacles. He says, don't sound that trumpet when you give. So there's a word play there, but more likely, Jesus is using a word picture to describe the audacious pop and circumstance associated with giving in Israel. When you give, literally the sense of this next phrase is, don't trumpet before you. Don't trumpet before you. Don't announce, okay everyone, I'm giving. And it's going to be a lot, so brace yourself, right? Right? Now, nobody would ever say that, but isn't that in our sinful hearts what we might be thinking in the moment? He says, that's what the hypocrites do. That's what they do all the time. They get themselves, they get right that check and then, here we go. They get all ready to go. It's in their heart. Hypocrites is the Greek word. It refers to actors in plays who portrayed someone on stage that they're not in real life. So, This Greek word for hypocrite is literally actor. I'm not going to make a social commentary about Hollywood right now, but there's something to this. You're you're portraying something to other people that you're not really who that person is in real life. You're playing a part. You're playing a role. That's the essence of hypocrisy, that you're portraying something or someone that you actually aren't on the inside. Jesus used this term of the Pharisees seven times 
in Matthew 23 alone. Because he knew, he knew inside their hearts that they were not who they portrayed themselves to be. Outwardly, they appeared to be devout, religious, generous, wise. They were leaders. They were the most righteous people in Israel. But he knows that inwardly they were ravenous wolves. They were pompous, and prideful, self-serving, greedy snakes. He actually accuses them because they were guilty of it. He says, you rob widows' houses. When a wealthy woman loses her husband, when he dies, and she gets all the money and has to take care of herself, as soon you read the paper, he tells them, and as soon as a widow loses her husband, you go to their house and you say, oh, dear sister, let, let me help you manage this, this affair. And they say, oh, of course, Rabbi, yes, please help me. And they just rake her over the coals and they bleed her dry until she's dead. They were doing this and Jesus caught on and he told them, you rob widows houses. It's atrocious. But here Jesus says to the people, don't be like the hypocrites who sound a trumpet when they give in the synagogues and in the streets. Those are the two very public places in the synagogue, in the streets. Don't put on a show. Don't sound a trumpet. And then he gives them a motive for their behavior. He says, they do this so that they will be honored by men. The word honored here is doxadzo. Dox is the word for glory. So literally, Jesus says that the goal of such people to give in this way is so that they will receive glory from other people. They do this for their own glory. Not to give it to God, but to get it from people. And that's why it's wrong to give in this way. Don't give anything for the purpose of being noticed. When you give, beloved, don't do it so that anybody else will notice. Jesus says, truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. The word here that's used in the Greek refers to a received payment. A received payment. In other words, if you give so that you'll be noticed by others, Jesus says that you will receive some sort of reward, but the sum total of what you actually receive and what is paid to you in full is whatever is said to you in the moment. So you will receive something if you do that, but it's going to begin and end right then and there with whatever you get for glory right here in the moment on earth. That's the end of it. There's no eternal, grander thing by God. You have received your full reward. I, I oftentimes notice this. Since becoming a pastor, it's, uh, I've observed a weird phenomenon. I, I think it's something that people do that they don't realize that they're doing. Uh, but I'm on to you, so don't. It happens all the time, and here's how it goes. And again, I think it's, I think it's done with the best of intentions, but I, I just want to illustrate to you. Someone comes to me and they say, Pastor, did you hear about so-and-so? Yeah, they're really struggling, and they could really use some prayer. And I say, oh, absolutely, of course. And then they proceed. You know, I was over there the other day. And I think to myself, oh, no. It looked like they could use some grocery money. I'm thinking, don't do it. Don't do it. So, you know, I, I gave them $50. And then I'm thinking, ah, you just lost it. Everything, and then they keep on talking. Everything that you're going to receive for that generosity, you just got it right now. And it, we do it all the time because we have a propensity to seek glory for ourselves. So my goodness, don't tell me, for your sake and for mine, don't tell me when you give to other people. Now, I'm, I'm sure you're logging in your mind. Did I ever do that? I, it doesn't matter. I've forgotten. You've forgotten. It doesn't matter. Okay? You get, you, get a, you get a mulligan for this one. If you really feel bad, then please repent and take it up with God. But I'm just saying that we as a people have a propensity to do this. It's a weird thing we do. And even if you tell yourself, I'm not going to tell anybody, I'm not going to do the wrong thing, and then you get into a conversation and it comes out and you're like, oh, I did it again. Again, but the Bible says that if you do that, you've just received your reward in full. Whatever you get in the moment, that's going to be it. Do you ever wonder why you feel crummy when you give to others? Has it ever happened to you when you feel you just don't feel like it was that great? Well, I would argue this because your motive might be wrong. Your motive is wrong. 
Because when you give to receive praise, and then you don't get it, when they don't fall over you with gratitude and gush over you, you feel cheated. You feel cheated. I actually had a person come to me one time. They had gone to someone and they'd give them something, and the person didn't respond in the way that they thought that they should. They actually came to me and they said, Pastor, you should really talk to that person about their lack of gratefulness. And I went, okay. I agree we should have a meeting, but not with them. I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're sick and twisted people. We're sinful at heart. We are desperately wicked people. But when the, when the experience of giving, when it lets you down, when they don't come through, when they don't go, oh, thank you so much. Because sometimes they might receive the gift and not know what to say. Or they're just in such a terrible place that they don't even recognize what's going on. Maybe they just don't respond the way you thought. Maybe they got screaming kids in the back and they're distracted as you come in the door. Who knows? But the bottom line is that if you're doing it to get something from them and they don't deliver, you're going to become bitter. You're going to become angry. Because the the word that you receive on earth from them was not all that you hoped and dreamed it was going to be. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't give in order to be seen by men. There's another way that we hijack our own giving. Instead of seeking praise from others, you seek praise from yourself. You give because it makes you feel good. But all you're doing is you're just nothing more than a benevolence adrenaline junkie. Millionaires do this all the time. All the time. Celebrities. Here's how it goes. This is, I've seen, you've seen this a million times, I guarantee it. Celebrities, they come into a whole bunch of money, they become famous, and they spend the early part of their life blowing all of it on partying and loose living and whatever. And then at a certain point in their life, they kind of sober of all that, and they realize that that's not, not all there is. And so what do they do? They engage then in charity because they want to feel Good, And you watch TV shows about millionaires who kind of stoop down and give to other, other people. And at the end of the show, they always have the wrap-up and they say, well, you know, I want to do this because it makes me feel good to bless other people. It's all about them. It's all about them. They give because it makes themselves feel good. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, this might seem a bit odd, because you're thinking to yourself, okay, now, biologically, physiologically, your brain controls the actions of both your left and your right hand, so how can you do that? How can you give with one hand and your other hand doesn't know what's going on, your brain doesn't know what's going on? Is that possible to be out of sync and be... Well, no, Jesus is talking about something else. He's speaking in hyperbole here. The sentiment has to do with secrecy and with discretion with regards to giving. Not only should you not trumpet your giving to other people, but you shouldn't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing in your giving. Well, how do you do that? How do I obey this verse? How do I give in such a way that my left hand over here does not know what my right hand is doing? Give quietly and forget quickly. Give quietly and forget quickly. In other words, don't let your mind dwell on the action. If you give, give, and then back away, go about your business, and try to forget that you ever did it. Now, I've seen people do this before. And when I say I've seen people, I've thanked a person for a gift, and they have forgotten, and I have to remind them why I'm thanking them. And that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Thank you very much for your generous gift. And they look at me for a second, and it's, it's genuine, by the way. And they look at, what? Oh, you, you gave me the, oh, yeah, 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 absolutely, sure, no problem. They have forgotten. They've literally forgotten what they did. That's a blessed thing. That's a blessed thing. That's, that's an example of not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing. As soon as the gift leaves your hand, let it also leave your memory. Why? Why? Because, you know, I'm, I'm putting myself out there. I want to obey the Lord. I want to give. Why? Verse 4. Why should we do all these things? So that your giving will be in secret. And here is. Here's the payoff. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Oh, this is good. Two outcomes here. 
Number one, you want to do this because you want for the purpose of secrecy. So you don't blow the trumpet. You don't praise yourself. You do it in secret. You do it quietly because you want it to be secret. So uh, this comes in a couple of different ways. Maybe you make your gift anonymously. That way, literally, nobody but God knows. People give anonymously all the time. They, they put money, they give money in the box, they, put, they give money to someone, they drop off something uh, at their house, or they, they drive a gift to their house, and they just drop it off. They don't put a, a name or anything, they leave. And, and literally, nobody in the world knows who gave except God. That's one way to do it. But the other way to do it, I think, which is fair, is to make the gift understated. Understated. Because sometimes anonymous doesn't always work out the way that it needs to work out. Let me give you an example. Instead of saying, okay, here you go. I know it's a lot, but you really, uh, I really want to bless you. Don't do that. Rather, instead, when you make your gift understated, here you go, I love you, to God the glory, and you just leave. You just just under, undersell the gift, okay? And ultimately, this is about the glory of God. And when you give, especially to other people, my friends, don't bring it up again. This happens. We, we, we hijack ourselves. Because down the road it becomes like a, like a playing card. Well, you know, there's that time when I... Uh, don't do that. Don't do it. Let God be the one who sees. Do this in a quiet way. A secretive way. A non-theatrical way. But there's a greater reason for this humble discretion... Jesus says, so that, that's a result, so that your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. See, oftentimes I think we get worried that if we give, it's going to go unnoticed. It's going to go, especially if it's a big gift that no one's going to see and somehow that it's, going to, it's just going to go out of existence and never be counted. Oh, it's just going to go out into the ether and I'll never, oh, and you get worried about what's going to happen to this gift. Now, certainly there's record keeping. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what happens to you spiritually. I'm giving all this and no one will ever know. Oh, yes, they will. God sees all. God sees what you're doing. He's watching. He's paying attention. He's keeping record. God knows every cent you've given. God knows every deed you've done. God knows every kind word you've ever spoken. And God knows every secret prayer that you've uttered. When you pray for someone that you care about and say they'll they'll never know. I've heard stories, countless stories, about two believers that come together and meet and this person gets saved and they find out that this person was praying for them 10 years before they got saved and there's this amazing moment of gratitude and love but they never told anybody. They just prayed quietly for someone else and the Lord heard The Lord hears. He knows everything. God is watching. This is not a passive thing. God is actively engaged in what you do. And He cares about you, what happens to you spiritually. If you give cheerfully, quietly, generously, God will see. And Jesus says that our Father in heaven will reward you. And let me tell you that the rewards that God gives are better than any empty thrill we could obtain here on earth. Any empty praise you're going to get, any pat on the back, any plaque on a wall, anything you could obtain on earth for all of your generosity will pale in comparison to what God will reward you with. However, if you practice your righteousness before men in order to be noticed by them, if that's your motive... Jesus says, you will have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. That that, that needs to be a sobering thing that you hear. If you give, if you're generous, if you practice your righteousness, and this gets applied to prayer and fasting as well, but if you practice your righteousness in order for other people to see how religious you are, you will have no reward for that in heaven. But as we consider how we give Settle in your minds that the whole point is to honor God with whatever you do. Whatever you do, it doesn't matter what it is that you're doing, whatever you do. The Reformers used to say, we live our lives quorum Deo, before God, in front of God, in the theater of God. Where He's the only participant in this. 
He's the only one who sees. And we live in front of Him, and He's the one who is glorified by what we do. As you consider how you are to be generous, consider the generosity of God to give to us beyond measure. God gives common grace to all people. He, I mean, the breath in the lungs of every human being on the planet is a gift of God. He gives materially, He gives blessing upon blessing to all kinds of people. He gives earthly blessings. He gives you blessings of family. He gives you blessings of security. But above all, for those who love Christ, the greatest blessing we've ever received is the gift of salvation. Because our temporal blessings, that's only for a hundred years and then we're gone. But God has given us a blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I'm I'm reminded of John 14 when the disciples are worried about what's going to happen when he goes. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. He says, in my Father's house are are many dwelling places. The old translation was many mansions. And people get all fired about mansions in heaven. But he says, I go to prepare a dwelling place for you, a room for you, a home for you. And when I return, I'm going to take you with me. I I have created a whole inheritance, a whole heavenly dwelling, a paradise for you, where you're going to dwell with me in glory forever. My goodness, I mean, that blessing, that inheritance is worth more than anything that we could have here. But that's his promise. And how do you get there? How do you get to be in this eternal, heavenly, glorious dwelling. You have to be in Christ. You have to be in Christ. This is only known by those who are born again by faith. Those who recognize that, you know, those same sins of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the the selfishness and the deceitfulness and the the pride-seeking, the glory-seeking, the sinful heart that I know that I have, God doesn't want any part of that. But if you recognize that you have sinned before God, confess your sins to God. Repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus came to earth, lived on this planet, and went to the cross and paid the penalty of sin. He had all of the collective sins, any sin that I could possibly manufacture in my idle factory of a heart, has been placed on him on the cross. And the Bible says it was taken out of the way, nailed to the cross, and the penalty for that sin is put to death. And so, my my friends, there is forgiveness for sins. There is a new life in Christ. And it's not just about getting saved. It's about belonging to God and being God's and being redeemed by God and then having an eternal blessing, a dwelling with God forever. The, The ultimate reward of Christianity is not simply forgiveness, even though that's huge. It's restoration. It's reconciliation. You get to be with the God who formed you in the womb. With the God who designed your soul and built you. The God who pours out His love and His mercy on you. There's no better place than I can think of to be with a God who is also so generous. We have a gracious, loving, generous, glorious God who is worthy of all of our praise. Let's pray. God, thank you for putting us at the right place at the right time. God, your word is so rich and so full. And Lord, you know how to work on our hearts in such a precise way. God, I'm thankful for the Sermon on the Mount. I'm thankful for the teaching of Jesus Christ. Not just for the the glory and the splendor and the wisdom and the power of the teaching but I'm also thankful for the the way that this teaching chastens us and disciplines us. Lord, you've purposed from the beginning of time that our church would be in this passage right now, that we would be working through verses that cut to our hearts, that deal with our our issue of lust, our, our, our marriages, our families, our feelings toward other people, our prayers, our money, our dwelling places, our food, our worries, our fears, everything, every single part of who we are as people, you have an answer for, you have a a verse for, you have a doctrine for. Because you know how to take care of us, God. You know what, what deeply ails us, and you know 
how to fix it. You are the great physician. And so God, as our church considers moving forward on a, on a larger scale what to do, we ask for wisdom when it comes to our finances, our generosity, our giving, all those things. But God, more importantly than that, more importantly than that, I pray that you would minister to the hearts of believers here, that you would do a, a greater work. Whatever idols of our hearts that we have, I pray that you would smash those and that righteousness would reign in our hearts. I pray that you would teach us, teach me how to be generous. Teach us how to be disciplined uh, with our spirituality, with our, our life in Christ. And help us, Lord, not to seek glory for ourselves, but to glorify God, to glorify you in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh. Yes. I just realized I totally forgot something. Can the elders come up? Colby Hammond is supposed to come into membership today, and I don't want to skip that. That's really important. I apologize, Colby. Come on up. Let me compose my mind here. Sorry. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle just saved that moment here. <laughs> Come on over. Right here, next to me. Okay. All right, very good. All right, so as we've been working through um, talking about membership, talking about this church growing, the Lord has uh, blessed us to grow us with believers. And uh, I've known Colby since he was a lot smaller. He was in the congregation for my very first sermon, so he's, I've known him for a long time. Uh, but I, we've known his family, I've known his family, but we've gotten to know Colby as a believer And uh, he's been through our classes, and we've been able to hear his testimony and his love for the Lord, uh, his desire for discipleship, his desire to lead and to teach people and to help people understand the faith. And uh, he articulated to us, there's nothing more important to him than helping people grow spiritually. So we're really excited about that, and we're thankful for his testimony of faith. And so uh, we're going to pray for him, and then we would like to welcome him into membership. So we're going to pray for him right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are drawing people to yourself, that you grow the body of believers. Father, we don't determine who are the members of your body, but you do. You know who is Christ's body. So help us, Lord, to continue to identify and to to bring up and to cherish these people. I thank you, Lord, for Colby and his faithfulness and his uh, his zeal for the gospel. Uh, Father, I can't manufacture that. That comes from you. So thank you uh, for the love that you've put in his heart. And I pray that uh, he would bless this church uh, richly and that we would be a blessing to him. We could shepherd him well. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.